The Genshin fandom is one of favoritism, having a very strong anime aesthetic and appeal towards that kind of community. Anyone who's so much as taken a peek at the anime rabbit hole are privy to scores of people choosing one or more characters as their waifu or husbando. Admittedly, I myself am guilty of this too, heaven knows I'm a closet weep. When Genshin Impact first came out and we only had around 20 characters to choose from, one immediately stood out as a fan favorite, Kuching. Her design, personality, and gameplay resonated with a big portion of the fanbase, evidenced by her personal subreddit, Kuching Mains being the largest in size out of all the others. Since then, she's amassed a cult following that grew to the point where despite being called Kuching Mains, the platform has become a flagship and trusted source of information and guides, offering complete, up-to-date, and comprehensive breakdowns on most if not all units within the game, not just her. To this day, Kuching holds a special place in the hearts of many, myself included. For the entirety of version 1, I would say she was far and away my most geared up character. She was also my first and only 5 star to ever be intentionally C6, and her Why No One Place episode was my first ever video to break 1 million views. I never expected my second channel to reach that milestone before my first one. Anyways, the widespread appeal has shifted away from her in favor of the ever growing colorful cast of new characters. Kuching has had one of the most storied histories among Genshin's roster, and a pretty tumultuous one at that. So for today, let's take a moment to delve into what happened to Kuching. What was she like back then, and how is she doing now? To say that she was the quintessential example of waifu over meta would be an understatement. Though she wasn't anywhere close to being a bad unit, circumstances were not in her favor right from the beginning. Version 1's roster had primarily three main popular damage dealers to choose from, forming the first, albeit very primitive, meta, herself, Diluc, and Razor. Bear in mind, we're talking like the first couple weeks of the game before anyone knew anything. Kuching was the fastest attacker of the group, owing to her being a sword wielder compared to their great swords. Her consistent DPS was her main selling point, having a potent 1 2 combo with her fast and powerful, albeit costly, charge attack. Objectively speaking, she was a strong character and a welcome addition for anyone lucky enough to pull for her, if they were lucky enough to pull for her. Two things made it difficult for her to find meaningful widespread success. The first being her obvious inaccessibility. Five stars on the standard banner were both really easy to get and really hard to get. They're technically available in every single event wish as off-banner units, but the lack of guarantee in getting them means you could go hundreds, nay thousands of pulls without so much as getting even one copy of them. It was sheer luck if you got her, especially back then. On the other hand, getting your hands on Razor was a far less taxing endeavor, and though he was a 4-star, he was able to both take advantage of our premature understanding of the game's mechanics and limited options to great effect, and with decent enough investment his damage output wasn't too far behind Kuching's, if not on par with her. The second was the giant multimillionaire Kaya hating elephant in the room, Diluc. While also unreliably difficult to get, his overall damage ceiling, area coverage, and element were a strict upgrade to Kuching's, not in any way detracting from the latter's viability, but most people saw the former as the superior DPS character. Consequently, when the first tier list came out, with Electro being the inferior DPS element to Pyro and her being far more cumbersome and expensive to acquire than Razor, Kuching received a modest assessment of good, certainly worth using, but nowhere near the best or most efficient choice. She held on to her tenuous reputation of being good enough to main for the better part of early version 1, although most of that had to do with the first wave of featured units being either supports or an acquired taste. Beginning of version 1.2, we were introduced to the Liyue trifecta, Ganyu, Shao, and Hu Tao, advancing the main DPS category by a substantial margin. What made these three stand out was how noticeably high their damage ceiling and floors were, among many other things. This marked a turning point where Kuching's viability gradually declined over the next year and change. Curiously, she was the only 5-star character of the original 5 to receive her own featured banner taking place between Xiao and Hu Tao. Not really sure why, but I'm guessing it's because of popular demand. Like I said, Kuching was a huge fan favorite. Even so, her banner sales were less than stellar, trailing well behind everyone else. Granted, this is only a portion of the entire Genshin player base, namely all iOS revenue from China. In addition, banner sales don't correlate to a character's power. Klee had extremely good sales despite being a pretty lackluster character over time. We can attribute her commercial success to new game hype and how adorable she is, but let's get back on topic. Even with the Liyue trio, Kuching was still in a decent position and was more than capable of handing Genshin's endgame content at the time, but there was a noticeable difference between them and her that became more pronounced with each passing version. New 5-star characters were being released with higher overall damage, more area coverage, and better quality of life, if not from their own devices then from their surroundings. Ganyu's damage numbers are overall higher than Kuching's, but it's offset by a lower rate of fire. However, belonging to the cryo element, she has access to reverse melt and freeze, far more effective reactions than electrocharge, overload, or superconduct at least in terms of what Ganyu was after. Shao and Hu Tao were just flat out stronger. Moreover, all three of them had better uptime and an easier time executing their combos. Kuching struggled with a few things that made playing to her win condition more tedious than it had to be. High stamina cost, far too short a timer from herself in view, charge attacks knocking away smaller enemies, and once again, the absence of a good reaction to work with. 
Having her featured banner take place right before arguably the strongest main damage dealer in the game certainly at that point in time was kind of bad timing too. I say arguably because Shangling was a hot second in earlier versions of National, but to reiterate this was way way back in the day before proper team compositions were theorized. If Kuching's banner was in 1.0 or even 1.1, I think she would have done a lot better. But in 1.3, player rosters were getting more fleshed out with some semblance of a working team, and everyone and their mothers were saving up in anticipation of Hu Tao. Reasons to use coaching over others were diminishing steadily. Much of her early appeal stemmed from her being one of the only choices for consistent damage at the time. Now there were a lot more characters to work with, and they had kits more efficient and less counterproductive. Following the release of Eula in 1.5, an on-field carry with potential damage numbers that far eclipsed anything we've seen to date. The difference in strength between coaching and those that came out after became more and more apparent. Yet despite being measurably powercraft, she was still the best main DPS for Electro unless you were one of the rare few who went machine gun official. So if you were an Electro fan, she was still the only one for you. Pyro and Cryo hogged all of the market share for version 1, leaving Hydro, Animo, Geo, and especially Electro pretty much neglected the whole time. But with version 2, that all changed. Not too long after gaining entry to Inazuma, we were graced with Miss Electro herself, Raiden Shogun, who, bluntly speaking, totally overshadowed Koting in every conceivable way. With her taking over the meta and popularizing the accessible yet very effective Raiden national team alongside the growing prevalence of team compositions, version 2 effectively signaled the death of Koting from a practical standpoint. Not that she was no longer able to clear the game's content, but there were just so many better options out there that pragmatically you'd be hard pressed to justify fielding her over Shogun or other carries, unless you specifically played for waifu over meta. That didn't stop people from trying their damnedest though. Coaching fans, and even me at one point, spent most of version 2 experimenting with her in different teams to hopefully find any possible combination of units that could make her at least somewhat meta, and the results were kind of mixed. They tried to go for a freeze coaching to make use of Superconduct's cryo application, they tried physical coaching to play into her fast attack speed and high base damage on a charge attack, they even entertained the thought of Electro Hyper Carry, kinda like how clean goes Mono Pyro, hyperdriving her with energy and Kujo Sada to abuse her extremely low cost low cooldown burst for big damage, which to her credit does quite a serious amount if you can spam it the moment it comes back online, but I believe ultimately what they settled on was a variant of Taser involving her. Transformative reactions got significantly buffed in 1.6, no longer making Electro's reactions vastly inferior to Pyro's amplifying ones, but even then, Kuching still had a tough time consistently applying Electro. She had good Electro damage, mind you, but it was more concentrated rather than spread out, as opposed to Fischl and Shogun, who had full consistency and near 100% uptime on their application. So it wasn't really Kuching Taser per se, just a Taser party with Kuching in it. She alone couldn't facilitate Electro enough, there had to be at least one other. As version 2 progressed, the dosage of Copium had to get stronger and stronger. In 2.0 we had Ayaka and Yoimiya, 2.1 we had Shogun, 2.3 we had Ito, 2.5 we had Yaimiko, 2.6 we had Ayato, 2.7 we had Yelan and Shinobu, Kuching was getting hammered on both ends. From a main TPS perspective, she was officially power crept. Almost a dozen units, Electro or not, were just strictly better than her if we go by sheer numbers. From an Electro perspective, the lineup received its Archon who was and still is every bit coaching superior, while Nikon and Shinobu won up to her in terms of application by being consistent off-field sources. It was a dark period for her, nevertheless, the Copium held strong, and against all odds, the Redemption arc was about to begin. Towards the tail end of version 2, word on Dentro's playability circulated discussion boards, along with announcements that one of the elements it synergized with would be Electro. Those who exhausted what little patience they had left were going Hawkeye, while everyone else hit the data mines for anything they could scrounge up that would help her out. Fortunately, we didn't have to wait too long for that. Kuching would finally be saved. Arriving in version 3 was Dendro and his two main reactions, Catalyze, aka Quicken, and Bloom. Now just to reestablish Kuching's playstyle for a moment, her entire premise was speed. While Diluc and Razor were mainly concerned with power, what drew a lot of players towards her was a rushdown, rapid attacking, death by a thousand cuts playstyle. The problem was, there wasn't exactly a good time or place for that, and in cases where rapid attacking actually was good, her burst oriented nature conflicted with the need for a consistent application. Again, she could work with taser based teams, but comparatively speaking, there were better options out there, namely off field units. So she was in a limbo state where her playstyle entailed rapid attacks, but her electro application didn't come in the form of a steady stream like Fischl, Miko, Shinobu, or Shogun. It was concentrated into a few hits, which is why she wasn't optimal for taser teams. Dendro would finally solve that issue with Quicken. Combining Electro with Dendro on a target would apply a status effect for the next few seconds, whereby all subsequent Electro or Dendro applications on that target would get a flat bonus, doesn't matter how many attacks or how strong they were. Quantity over quality was the name of the game for this reaction. You could land a thousand Electro or Dendro hits all dealing one damage, and assuming they're separate applications of either element, Quicken would buff each and every single one. This was exactly the kind of thing Kuching needed. Her 1-2 charge attack combo was among the fastest in the game I think even to this day, giving her a steady stream of augmented damage. 
Furthermore, Stellar Restoration was also two hits, the Stiletto and the Teleporting Slash. Last but definitely not least, Starward Sword, condensing 10 hits in a decently sized area with once again the lowest possible energy cost and cooldown we have to date. Sadly, that doesn't mean 10 aggravate empowered attacks. Star Wars Sword may attack 10 separate times, but it only applies Electro 4 times due to internal cooldown. In spite of that, however, when executed correctly, Aggravate skyrockets Kuching's DPS numbers because she can apply many Electro hits in a short time frame. That's the key factor separating Taser from Aggravate. Taser prefers consistent elemental application, while Aggravate doesn't care about consistent application. It only cares about having as much as possible regardless of if it's over a short or long amount of time. Since version 3, public opinion towards Kuching has improved considerably, where many people consider her a worthwhile carry once more. In general, she still falls short of competing with the likes of Shogun, Fischl, Shinobu, and whatnot, but most of their success comes from their off-field uses. On-field-wise, Kuching has more or less reclaimed her spot as the best pure on-field electro character in the game, which is enough to at least get Kuching means to lower their copium dosage. No, but seriously, I think where she is now is exactly what people were hoping for. Kuching isn't top of the line, but she's good enough for people to not feel bad about playing her. That's the important part. Not every character has to be super crazy overpowered. In fact, that would be terrible for the game. And when everyone's super, <laughs> no one will be. Instead, the best way to balance a game with a lot of character selection is to give each of them niche to excel in so that they don't cannibalize each other for party space. Kuching's niche is being the on-field damage dealer. I mean, technically Shogun's also an on-field damage dealer if you want her to be, but if you're looking for a dedicated one, your choices are either her, Sino, or Razor. On that note, there were concerns about Sino replacing Kuching, but Sino is more for Hyperbloom teams while Kuching specializes in Quicken if I'm not mistaken. In any case, she has a niche, and she performs relatively competently in it although she could be a lot better if they gave her actual direct buffs. What Dendro did for her was accentuate her strengths and give them an actual place in the meta. She's fast and is a very low cost low cooldown ultimate, but she's still held down by a severe lack of quality of life. That goes for almost all the initial 5 stars. Those weaknesses can't be overlooked and will forever hold her back. In other words, Kuching may have a decent spot in the meta right now, but that's a result of her being one of the only choices for her specific niche. Also, her return to form isn't a result of her own personal ability, but external circumstances that apply to everyone. So the moment another Electro main DPS comes out with better concentrated Electro application, Kuching will go back to where she was before. Hopefully that doesn't happen for a while, but unless Mihoyo plans to remain at this scale of balance and perpetuity, the possibility of Kuching getting power crept once more is still very much real. That being said, this is supposed to be a positive video, and it is. It's awesome to see how her situation has changed for the better, if only temporarily. I'm still hoping for a potential retroactive buffer, like ascending a character to level 100 and giving them a new talent or skill maybe to actually make her good again instead of riding the coattails of Dendro, but this will do for now. To wrap things up, Koting went from being a good unit to a not so good unit to a pretty bad unit back to a good unit. I think I speak for most coaching mains when I say we're not expecting her to be the best unit in the game, we just want her to have a place in the meta. She has a very fluid playstyle and a big presence in Liyue, not to mention she's more of a fighter than fellow Qixing Ningguang, so narratively speaking, her in-game strength should make an effort to reflect that. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of what happened to for Kuching. Feel free to share your thoughts on her in the comments down below. Aside from that, it would be awesome if you could leave a like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Farsfarm, join my Discord server, and check out my other what happened to episodes if you haven't yet. But for now, thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.